I am Dr. Kelly Morgan. I'm a critical race culture historian. And so my work really champions African American art. What's up y'all? I am back finally after a very long and much needed hiatus um, for rest and recovery. You know, fighting crazy white folks and white supremacy out in these museum streets ain't no joke. Um, I talk about that, you know, all the time. Um, and this most recent fight that I just put up took a lot out of you girl. So I kind of needed a minute. Um, so no longer in Indiana. I am now in the A. Um, I've left Indy and just really wanted to come be closer to my family. So if you can see behind me, you see all of the football and basketball paraphernalia. I'm actually in my nephew's room <laughs> making this video. Um, and as much as, you know, um, I thank everybody for just the outpouring of support and, you know, thanks and well wishes, you know, during this time. Um, and now I'm back, you know, uh, teamed up again, you know, with Black Art in America um, to go back to my art history videos with something that uh, Najee and I spoke about recently, which is what this is, um, is making longer videos, right? Like a lot of you guys I know um, attend, you know, my public lectures at various institutions around the country, particularly now since everything is on Zoom. Um, and we wanted to really create, you know, a body of work where you can get more information um, and a longer set, right, um, of me discussing, you know, particular eras of african-american art historic eras of african-american art and as well as legacy or what we like to call the legacy artist so this discussion is growing out of work that i kind of started um when during my time at the pennsylvania academy of fine arts when i discovered while working there and i discovered in terms of like you know columbus syndrome discovered um, <laughs> discovered in regards to it was new you know information for me but that me to work fuller may howard jackson and laura wheeler wearing um all three you know pretty well known um and very important black women artists uh working at the from, or I should say from, right? The turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. So 1880s, 1890s um, to, well, I would say well into the 1950s, right? Um, all three of them were students, you know, at PAFA, um, you know, like one right behind each other. And I was over the moon, you know, cause I'd known about their work, um, but had not put together, you know, that they were um, all PAFA students and that actually Jackson and Fuller were actually students um together like attended path at the same time um and so i worked into this project you know because I, I was writing my dissertation finishing my dissertation at the time um and so i created with the um lecture that i'm getting that i'm gonna give today um about the three of them you know working them into the concept of my dissertation but not necessarily literally right into my dissertation so there's not now we know that the core of 20th century black feminist thought is full of discussions of african-american women's resistance to racist mythologies regarding black female identity and the black female body nevertheless when discussing these issues regarding imagery representation race gender um much of the scholarship hesitates to link african-american women's intellectual and cultural traditions right of self-definition self-valuation self-respect self-reliance and independence to the essential factors of vision and visuality and figurative portrayals of black womanhood by african-american women visual artists though the existing body of literature that examines the history of African-American women's art making and issues of representation isn't super vast. Um, scholars and curators dedicated to the subject have definitely illustrated that from the 19th century to the present, African-American women creating from various backgrounds and across a myriad of styles and mediums have consistently produced works to confront and reject stereotypical representations of black women. In relationship to Black feminist ideology, this commitment among African American women artists to challenge oppression in American visual culture represents a form of what Patricia Hill Collins calls Black women's shared self-divine standpoint of resistance. 
explaining how African-American women's resistance to oppression in a broader sense exists as a collective decision. Collins writes, quote, the long term and widely shared resistance among African-American women can only have been sustained by an enduring and shared standpoint among black women about the meaning of oppression and the actions that black women can take and should take to resist it. So the more I thought specifically about black women's material realities, like what does the black female experience literally look like in American culture, right? Over time, um, how are African-American artists communicating, particularly African-American women artists, like how are they communicating that reality? What are African-American women, women artists doing if they're doing much more than just like painting pretty pictures, right? What is that something, right? And we know they are doing way more. Um, and what are the differences, right? And how they're communicating it now, you know, versus the 19th century, the early 20th century, the mid 20th century. Um, and so I started looking at um, works by Fuller, Jackson and Waring um, and other people. I looked at, you know, um, Augusta Savage and Elisa, um, Elizabeth Catlett, you know, Ammonia Lewis um, to demonstrate, you know, and then, and again, in this piece, I'm only going to talk about Jackson Willer, um, sorry, Jackson Fuller <laughs> and Waring. Um, but it was fascinating to me to see that how in different historical periods, you know, these women were employing various mediums um, and creating from individual political thoughts and intellectual views and aesthetic interests, you know, really to emphasize the multidimensionality of African American or Black women's material reality. So at the turn of the 20th century, both May Howard Jackson and Meta Ward Fuller emerged as important African-American women, with Fuller becoming recognized as one of the most significant fine artists of her generation. 20th century critics often praised her works and frequently linked her to Henry Oswald Tanner. Both Jackson and Fuller were born in Philadelphia in 1877 and only a month apart. Jackson was born in May and Fuller was born in June. Both attended Philadelphia Public Schools as well as the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. This is one of the reasons I was so excited about right, this project because it gave me the opportunity to show viewers just how instrumental PAFA was in training several African-American artists in Philly during the early 20th century. Um, though even during their time at PAFA, you know, they, they definitely faced discrimination. In 1899, Fuller decided to pursue her studies abroad and went alone to France where she studied with Rodin and was inspired by other French artists until 1902. May Howard Jackson was the first African-American woman to study at PAFA, but she declined Fuller's 1899 invitation to study abroad, choosing to forego training in Paris in efforts to develop a unique sculptural style minus a European influence. And this is really important because Jackson was really dedicated to developing an artistic style that wasn't just representative of Black women's experiences, but purely steeped in the tenets and the principles and the realities of those experiences, right? So she was trying to literally build, right, a Black feminist or maybe even a Black womanist, even though those two terms, you know, were not um, utilized as such back then. But a Black feminist artistic framework, right? So it was like, I don't need, you know, Europe to tell me, right, how to create the images, you know, of my life, right? The only thing that I need to do that <laughs> is my own life, right? It's my own experiences. Um, and as a result, you have works like what you see here, Mulatto, Mother and Child, um, which illustrates the pain experienced by mixed race or excuse me, mixed race African-Americans in the first half of the 20th century due to the inherent contradictions of racial categories. With downcast eyes, Jackson's figure protectively cradles her infant, yet her hair doubles as a shroud of flames that engulfs her and, and her child in the paradox of America's racial burden. A very fair-skinned woman herself, Jackson experienced the distress of American racism firsthand when the National Academy of Design refused to exhibit any of her work after learning that she was in fact colored. In our current racial moment, where the boundaries of America's ethnic composition are becoming simultaneously more complicated and rigid, um, Jackson's sculpture references an early 20th century sentiment that continues to plague contemporary American society. Meter Warwick Fuller's Ethiopia Awakening 
demonstrates the links between the black woman and the contemporaneous notions of African contributions to Western civilization. Commissioned in 1921 by MAACP leaders James Weldon Johnson and W.E.B. Du Bois for New York City's Making of America Festival, Fuller's piece layers the material that she's using as well as design to depict Ethiopia in the act of unwrapping herself from the multiple bindings of mummification. Now this is extremely important when you consider the contemporary context in which she's presenting this figure, right? It's night, it's the 1920s. So this is the moment where a white archeologist, archeolo um, geologist, right? Egyptologists um, are quote unquote rediscovering, right? Or, um, redefining you know egypt as a one space that's not of africa right so that's the first issue um, secondly this is all happening because america is really trying to assert itself as a great civilization right and so in everything you know architecture again um archaeology geology science and medicine you know we are trying to assert ourselves in the in the 1920s um as this great civilization so we're aligned finding ways to align ourselves uh with past really great civilizations um greek civilization being one Egyptian civilization, right, being the other, right? So um, white historians, again, archaeologists, geologists, you know, ethnographers, right, begin to to whiten Egypt um, as a way, you know, to state claim, right, to Egyptian greatness. Well, African Americans, right, who are also working in science and history and art at this time, um, put up a challenge to that right and they take up or we take up Egypt um and it's and all of its Africanness you know as well as its greatness um so in this piece you see why right in that context Fuller chooses a black female figure emerging from the coffers of historical oppression and obscurity as a symbol of African Americans rise to full citizenship and enfranchisement so in this regard, Ethiopia Awakening is not only an artistic representation of African-American women rendering themselves visible, it is a powerful figure of work that symbolizes how the quotidian achievement of both Africans and African descendant peoples advanced the Western world. Throughout the 1920s and the 1930s, Laura Wheeler Waring received considerable recognition for the dexterity of her brushwork and how she captured the humanity of her sitters. Born in 1905 in Connecticut, Waring graduated from honors from high school and from PAFA in 1914. She won PAFA's Crescent Prize in 1911, and she traveled to Europe where she met with both Tanner and Cassatt and studied also the French Impressionists. She later developed the art and art education department at Cheney University, where she spent the duration of her career educating students of color in the visual arts. And one of the things, um, it's, there's a myriad of things, but one of the things that's like super dope about wearing um, is that she really was like a versioso. Um, so she's known very well for her portrait work, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but she was also an incredible, you know, impressionist painter, um, as well as an il illustrator before she graduated from PAFA. Um, she had made a name for herself around, you know, Philadelphia um, and even in other cities on the East Coast as just this amazing illustrator because she was doing, you know, professional illustration. Um, for several, you know, major businesses um, and stores in Philadelphia. Even in her later portraits, like this one of Marian Anderson, Waring uses an opulent color palette to indicate the Philadelphian contralto's grace and elegance. Because yes, like Waring, Fuller, and Jackson, Marian Anderson was also from Philly. Furthermore, Waring's expressive style not only reveals the influence of realism and impressionism, it illuminates the breadth of African-American women's artistic excellence as the impressionistic landscape over Anderson's shoulder signifies both Waring's time at the Académie de la Grande Chumier in Paris and Anderson's early training in Europe as well. Commissioned by the Harmon Foundation in 1943 for the exhibition, Portraits of Outstanding Americans of Negro Origins, 
Waring's portraits documented noteworthy African-Americans' contributions to the country. Modeling their goal of social equality, the Harmons sought portraits from both Laura Wheeler Waring and European-American artist Betsy Graves Renault. The two painters followed the conventional codes of academic portraiture, seeking to convey their sitters' extraordinary accomplishments. This painting, along with a variety of Waring's portraits of African-American intellectuals and artists, toured the country for over 10 years as a visual rebuttal to segregationist rhetoric.